ladies and gentlemen, I'm always worried by capacity audiences because I never know how the organizers manage to work out exactly what size hall to, to, to rent for the evening's entertainment. It's happened right the way across Canada, uh, Victoria, Vancouver, Prince George, Kelowna, Regina, Winnipeg, and now here. It, the, the, the audience that confronts me, th there are very few people standing, there are no empty seats. It, it's almost like a made-to-measure audience, a wall-to-wall -wall audience. And sometimes I wonder if, it's, if it's something's being rigged. It can't always work out like this. It, in Ottawa, however, uh, it's, the experience for me so far has been uh, quite unique. I don't understand why in Ottawa I am being given a rough time. And it is a rough time, ladies and gentlemen. If I was to tell you what we have had to go through, not just in Canada, but here particularly in Ottawa, in order to have this uh, meeting this evening, uh, I'm, I'm afraid you wouldn't believe it. We have had to put up with a concerted effort by various minorities in Ottawa to prevent me from speaking and I think that at the end of the hour's talk which I'm going to give you now, which we'll follow with about a quarter of an hour's interval, and then we're going to have an open and frank discussion when you can ask whatever questions you like using as hostile language as you like. Right, okay. Um, I hope that at the end of the hour's talk which I give this evening, followed by a quarter of an hour's interval, and then we'll have a very frank discussion afterwards, that you will agree that I have not said anything offensive to any minorities, that I have tried to be as objective as possible about very emotional subjects, and that really people who try to prevent me from speaking probably have something to hide. They probably have something to hide. And the more violent their opposition, the more uh, impressed one becomes by the notion that they probably have something to hide. I, I mean, in Victoria, for example, when I spoke in Victoria, they these opponents, they checked out who had placed the advertisement in the Times Colonist, the local newspaper, so they could... So they could... I wonder if I can turn it off somewhere. Okay. They checked out who had placed the advertisement in the local newspaper, the Times Colonist. Um, the, the... Most of this opposition, of course, comes from me very regrettably. I think we probably have some people at the back who are quite deaf by the sound of it. <laughs> when the tour finally arrived here in Ottawa, I found that the maximum pressure had been brought to bear on the Congress Centre here, including delegations from various local minority groups, including six members of Parliament who had personally put pressure on the Congress Centre to dishonour the contract we had signed and including threats of all, all, all sorts of violence. And I find this totally reprehensible, and I would like to express here my personal thanks to the Congress Center here in Ottawa that they allowed the meeting to go ahead and made it clear right from the start that unlike a number of other uh, meeting places in Canada, they did not intend to be intimidated, but they were going to give free speech a, a, a run. So that is my personal word of thanks to Mr. Gordon Henderson, the chairman of the board of the Congress Center here. with an increasing um, campaign against me over the last 12 or 18 months, in fact, since I last came to Canada, uh, when I attempted to speak in, in uh, uh, Passau, in, in Bavaria. I arrived in the city and was escorted into the hall through the howling mob of communists outside, the usual protection of the hall, the riot police, the water cannon, and so on. I was escorted in by a police colonel who then handed me a document from the city council of Passau instructing me that I was prohibited from speaking. In Vienna, I cannot set foot. In Austria, I can't set foot because there's now an arrest warrant out for me. In, uh, in Munich, I am told, as a result of a speech I made on April the 21st, along roughly the same lines as I shall be talking to you today, an arrest warrant is also being taken out against me. Uh, I can stand up to these things. I think it's very unlikely that any of these cases would ever come to court because if they did, I know how to defend myself. Having worked in the archives, and having been proven repeatedly right, I have no doubt at all that in the long run I will be, I, I will be vindicated. I can give an example of how right I've been and how wrong the German and indeed the world's historians have been. On October the 3rd last year, I was in Berlin. 
I've been invited to Berlin by the Berlin television station, Zenderfries Berlin. And I asked what the invitation was for, and I was told that I was required to attend a, a round table discussion about that. And the other people present would be five notorious German historians, very famous German historians, Eberhard Jekyll, Arno Meyer, who was at Princeton University, a man called Rotenberger, and so on. And I said to Zenderfries Berlin, do these other historians know that I've been invited? Because experience tells me they will not agree to sit around the same table as me. They will not be willing to debate with me. And the producer of the program said, Mr. Irving, we're going to tell them, but we're the ones who run the program. And I thought, in German, Mausien. And sure enough, a few days later, I was telephoned by Zenderfries Berlin, very embarrassed, very apologetic. Mr. Irving, we're terribly sorry. We're going to have to uninvite you because the other historians have refused to sit at the same table as you. Well, I said, well, I'm very sorry, but you invited me to come to Berlin. You told me the flight to take by Pan Am. You told me the hotel to stay in, Hotel Kempinski. And I booked my flight and I booked my hotel room. So I will be in Berlin that evening, October the 3rd last year. And the producer said, Mr. Irving, I'm afraid you don't understand you are no longer invited to the studio, to the program. And I said, well, don't worry, I will not be in the studio. I will be outside the studio with a few of my friends. And with a few of my friends, in fact, we numbered 50 or 60, we paraded up and down, most undignified, but sometimes you are undignified. Life calls on you to be undignified sometimes. I paraded up and down outside the Zenderfries Berlin studio, carrying a placard. On one side of the placard, in German, Deutsche Historiker, Lügner und Feiglinger. Deutsche Historiker, Lügner und Feiglinger. And on the other side, in English, German historians, liars and cowards. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what German historians are. They're liars and cowards. They have lied about their own history for 45 years, even though by doing so they have poured slime on their own country, and in doing so, they poured slime on all Europeans indirectly because they've accepted the incriminations of the German people. And they are cowards because they refuse to debate with somebody who has been in the archives where they haven't and knows what the truth is. The only reason I mention this story, ladies and gentlemen, in, co in connection with today's other topic, is because that morning, October the 3rd, last year, I called a press conference in Hotel Kempinski in Berlin. 11 a.m., Hotel Kempinski, David Irving press conference. And all Berlin newspapers came, and the West German newspapers came, on that morning, October the 3rd, I keep on repeating the date, you'll see why. Last year, I said, ladies and gentlemen, to the newspapers, ladies and gentlemen, you won't believe this, but 12 months from now, Germany will be reunited. How about that? 12 months, I, of course, October the 3rd this year, Germany was reunited. That was the day of reunification, and I had predicted it, and I got it right down to the last pound, shillings, and pence. And I, don't, I mean, it was, it was, of course, a pure fluke. My 12-month estimate was approximate. This was spoken five weeks before the Berlin Wall came down. I was working in the East German Communist Archives for the new books that I'm writing, and just looking around told me that the East German state was on the point of collapse and could not survive possibly more than another 12 months. And not one German newspaper printed this. One English newspaper printed it, the Daily Telegraph. And in February, when I was in East Germany again, speaking to a big audience of 2,000 people, in fact, in, in Dresden, I mentioned this fact, and the Daily Telegraph repeated my prophecy about October the 3rd, and it said, we asked Mr. Irving why he made this prophecy and not one German journalist reported it. Answer of Mr. Irving in German, die deutschen Journalisten haben den Horizont eines Klosetten der That's the German part of the audience, ladies and gentlemen. German journalists have all the horizon of the laboratory in it. And this is true, and it's unfortunately true of a lot of journalists worldwide. The more they become embedded in what they do, the more they begin swimming with the stream of the media, be it television or radio or newspaper, the lower their horizon becomes. They sink down lower and lower. They no longer, after a time, dare to poke their head out over the rim where they can see what is happening. Whereas as a historian, I can be arrogant enough to say that being immersed, being rooted sufficiently far in the past, in the recent past, the last 40 or 50 years of European history, you can predict with a rough degree of accuracy what's going to happen. So I was able to predict that 12 months from October the 3rd last year, Germany would inevitably be reunited. And I can predict more and say that I think that five years from now, and this may produce a few shudders from opponents of mine in the audience, five years from now, I think that Germany and Austria will have the same currency, the Deutschmark, which is the first stage, of course, to a political union. Five years. Ten years from now, Germany will have back the lost eastern territories. Poland, Poland, 
Polish territories now, uh, Silesia, Pomerania, East Prussia. I think East Prussia itself, Königsberg, will be more difficult. But these are predictions that you can take on secure economic foundations. It's quite plain to me that Germany is now, economically speaking, on the march. Within 20 or 30 years from now, I think Germany will have attained in the East, in the Ukraine, and in White Russia, everything that Adolf Hitler sent out to achieve with his cancer divisions in June 1941, Operation Barbarossa. We can come back in 30 years' time, ladies and gentlemen, and meet here in the Congress Center, and you'll all be saying, well, David Irving was right again. I only mention these facts because I think that by being an independent writer, totally uninfluenced by the media, and totally unintimidatable, as you see in this evening again, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to thank you all as my audience for having braved the intimidation to come here and hear me. It is possible to say things with a certain degree of accuracy and accuracy and eventually be proved right. Which brings me to the second main topic of this evening's conversation, which is the great dark shadow which overhangs not just Germany and German history, but indirectly the whole of Europe, the whole of the white people, if you like, in Europe, a crime that we are supposed to have committed, the Germans, the Europeans, the white people, committing in Europe during World War II. It hangs over there like a shadow, uh, uh, an accusing finger pointed at all of us, either directly or indirectly. And because the historians, not just the German historians, but historians worldwide are such liars and cowards in this respect, they have not really dared to investigate it as they should. It's the Holocaust. It's Auschwitz, it's Treblinka, it's Majdanek, it's whatever that great tragedy was. And let me say right away in front, those who call me a Holocaust denier are wrong, because there's no doubt at all, it has to be said, and I know it's an uncomfortable truth, it's no doubt at all that various Nazi criminals in World War II, 1941, 1942, 1943, <coughs> did kill Jews and other minorities, other opponents, by the thousand at a time. There's no question at all. They machine gunned them into pits. They massacred them behind the Eastern Front. There's no question at all that this was going on. I have seen evidence which satisfies me in the archives, contemporary documents, not only German documents, but British documents. I'm not talking about the eyewitnesses. Eyewitnesses are notoriously unreliable. But the documentation in the archives has satisfied me that these massacres did take place. And they really have to be investigated because we need to know something about the psychology of the mass murderer who was able, usually they were SS officers aged 21 or 23 or something like that, who gave the orders. Nobody's really investigated how these crimes came about. One thing is plain to me as Adolf Hitler's biographer, having spent now 20 years of my life from 1964 onwards researching the private and official life of Adolf Hitler in the war years, Again, from the archives, from the records, I won the confidence of all Adolf Hitler's private staff, his secretaries, the generals, the field marshals. I got their diaries. I persuaded them to talk to me and talk honestly to me. So they admitted the dirt, the slime that happened in World War II. Having written Adolf Hitler's biography, it's quite plain to me that he never knew what was going on, whatever it was. Let's be as big as that. I've been around the world with my pockets stuffed with a thousand pound notes for the television programs and the radio shows and the journalists saying, here's a thousand pounds if you can find anywhere a contemporary German document showing that Adolf Hitler even knew about Auschwitz, shall we say. And they can't even do that. So I originally said, back in 1977, when I published my book, Hitler's War, my, the flagship of my writing career, that Hitler didn't know it was going on, whatever it was that was going on. But three or four years ago, I took another step further forward down the path of intellectual ruin, you might almost say, because it has brought me under more fire, more gunfire than any other topics that I have ventilated in my books. Three or four years ago, I said, I am now satisfied the reason Hitler didn't know it was going on was that it wasn't going on, whatever it was. And you see, I'm being deliberately vague. We'll be a bit more specific about how we define the word Holocaust in a minute. This word Holocaust had only really emerged in 1970. Before that, the other battleship cruising around the horizon of history was the battleship Auschwitz. The battleship Auschwitz, which was good enough for everybody because we had photographs, we had hundreds of eyewitnesses, we had the Auschwitz trial, we had innumerable war crimes trials where Auschwitz had figured as the capital ship of the enemy propaganda campaign against the Germans or the Europeans or whatever. It was a capital ship being used in a propaganda campaign. 
And if you want to ask me what my task now is as a historian <coughs> for the last three or four years, it's to paraphrase Winston Churchill's famous command in 1941, seek the Auschwitz. But I don't have to seek the Auschwitz, ladies and gentlemen. The Auschwitz is slowly sinking of its own accord. You understand what I mean by that sentence later on when we come to analyze what we understand under the concept of Auschwitz and why it is sinking of its own accord. If I can just say it straight away, there used to be a monument in Auschwitz to four million who had been murdered in gas chambers in Auschwitz. The monument was in Auschwitz concentration camp in every language of the convicts who had been taken to Auschwitz and used as slave labor and done away with. Four million. The Polish director of the Auschwitz Museum and Archives, a brave man called Franciszek Pieper, has ordered that monument to be dismantled and thrown away because it is not true. It was a concrete piece of memorial to a lie. It hasn't been replaced by any memorials yet because the historians are still arguing about what the figure should be. Franciszek Pieper says, and I, uh, I state that quite openly, he thinks the figure should be one million people killed in Auschwitz. I don't think he's right, and I'll explain that in a minute. The German historians, brave as they are, when questioned by the press agencies about this, said, oh yes, we always assumed it was one million. Wir sind immer davon ausgegangen, dass es sich um eine Million handelt. We always assumed that it was one million. Thus, the brave voice of the German historians. Historians, ladies and gentlemen, don't have to assume something. Their job is to find out what happened and why, not to assume something. But your brave German historians assumed it was one million, having previously assumed it was four million, and before that assumed it was six million. They are fooling around with figures in a, an almost criminal way. I'll give you another example. How many people died in the Soviet Union in World War II? What is the current figure? Well, I can hear voices saying 20 million. 22 million? Any advance on 22 million? Well, the most recent figure was by the president of West Germany, von Weizsäcker, who said 27 million Soviet citizens, soldiers, and others died in World War II. Thus is the size of the German crime against the Soviet Union, 27 million. And yet, if you look in the archives, Ladies and gentlemen, and this will interest the Germans among you, you will find the, the record of the secret meeting at Potsdam, July 1945, between Joseph Stalin and President Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill. Not uh, Roosevelt, but Truman and Mr. Churchill. And Stalin and Churchill had a private meeting on July 19, 1945, that was recorded by Churchill's interpreter, Major Burse. And here Stalin said to Mr. Churchill, you do realize that we in the Soviet Union have had to suffer nearly five million casualties in dead and missing during this war. This is Joseph Stalin, the Soviet dictator, speaking two months after the war's over. We have suffered nearly five million dead and missing in this war. And two days later, in the plenary session, the big three meeting at Potsdam, Stalin repeated that figure, nearly five million dead and missing in this war. So that's the true statistic, five million. And yet since then you've heard the figure inflated to 11 million, 17 million, 22 million, which had quite a long run, and now it's gone up suddenly to 27 million. You can't do this with history, ladies and gentlemen, particularly not when the statistics and the facts are available. And you can't do it with Auschwitz. You could only do it so long as the figures and facts on Auschwitz were not available. And since I have been here last time, ladies and gentlemen, 18 months ago in March last year, two important new bodies of evidence have become available, and I'm going, I'm going to go into them in some detail later on. The first body of evidence is evidence that has become available from the Soviet archives, thanks to Glasnost, thanks to President Gorbachev. We no longer have to wonder how many people died in Auschwitz from all causes. And the second body of evidence is even more remarkable, really, it's from the archives of the British Secret Service. It's from the archives of the British Code Breaking Agency. We find out that all along, for two years in the middle of the apparent period of massacre, 1942 and 1943, we British were reading the secret codes of the Commandant of Auschwitz and reading his daily messages. So we no longer have to wonder what happened. And if you're wondering now, ladies and gentlemen, why you had to run the gauntlet to come and hear me, and why, right across Canada, certain organizations have conducted a concerted campaign to stop me speaking, is because they realize that these are the last days of the legend. The battleship is beginning to sink, the battleship Auschwitz. 
and these are the two most potent weapons against it, the Soviet archives and the archives of the British Secret Service. Because, of course, until now, they've always been able to offer the cozy and comfortable suggestion that probably the Nazis destroyed all the evidence. That's why we don't find any evidence about the gas chambers. Ladies and gentlemen, I have worked in the archives now for about 30 years. Not only the German archives in Germany, but the captured German archives in Washington, the archives here down in Wellington Street, archives in Australia, all around the world where there's any kind of material, not only the German archives, but the interrogations and so on. And for 30 years, I have had my eyes open. I'm not a total idiot when it comes to reading German records, and I know how to interpret them, and I know what to look for. I know what to look for on a document so you can tell that something is missing from a document that should be there, which is a kind of additional further stage of expertise. Nobody can tell me that it is possible to destroy the records of an operation. Even if the Nazis had been omnipotent and omniscient and all-powerful, just like Hollywood tells us, even if Adolf Hitler in his dying gasp in the last three or four days of April 1940 had been able to order his staff to go out there into the ruins of the Third Reich and destroy all trips, every shred of evidence of what they were up to, we would still find something. The German archives weigh tens of thousands of tons. There's so much paper that even now, 45 years later, they still haven't been shifting them. And even if Hitler had said, go up there and destroy not only the top copy of my order, but the carbon copy and the eighth carbon copy, oh, and the teleprinter strips, of course, at this end that sent it out to the other end, and the teleprinter strips at the other end, and the carbon copies at the other end, and the private diary of the corporal who sat at the teleprinter and got a terrible shock when he saw the orders coming through, all the reports of what it was, and the man who writes a letter home to his mother saying that he's been, he, he knows about these terrible things that are going on. You cannot destroy all the contemporary written evidence and all Hitler's other crimes, and I emphasize that word, are contained in the German archives. The evidence of Hitler's order to kill the commissars, the evidence of Hitler's order to lynch Allied airmen in 1944, the evidence of Hitler's order to kill British and Canadian commandos in October 1942, the evidence of Hitler's order to wipe out the male population of Leningrad and Stalingrad if he had ever succeeded in getting those cities in his hands. That's there in the archives. So why is there not a trace of evidence of any order to kill six million Jews? Logically, there should be, because it's the biggest crime of a lot. This is the record breaker, and yet there's nothing in the archives. And even if it was physically possible to destroy all the evidence in the German archives, they still, Hitler still could not have destroyed the evidence in the British archives. Because this, of course, is what has recently become known over the last 15 or 20 years. That we British, during World War II, were decoding the most important German signals. The Germans were coding their, encoding their most important military and diplomatic signals, telegrams sent by radio. They were encoding them on a machine called the Enigma machine. They believed that it would take tens of thousands of years of calculations and computations to break the code of even one day. But they didn't realize that we British were going to develop a computer that could do that, because computers at that time in 39, 1940 didn't exist. And we developed a very ancient and a primitive computer with rooms full of thermionic valves that needed a huge center, uh, air conditioning plants to cool them down. And by 1939, we were making the first inroads into the German machine codes, the Enigma code. And by 1940, May 1940, we were reading the German Air Force operational signals, which meant that when the Luftwaffe, when Hermann Göring, a gentleman whose biography I've written at the back, when the Luftwaffe was sending a signal to a squadron upon London, or his Howell or Bristol or Liverpool, Winston Churchill knew within 10 or 15 minutes because we had decoded the signal often before the Luftwaffe squadron, the German Air Force squadron, had decoded it. So when Hermann Göring sent to Kampfgruppe 100 the orders to go from London, Winston Churchill knew about it. In 80 or 90 percent of the times, we knew in advance what the target of a Luftwaffe air raid was. So when London was going to be bombed, of course, Winston Churchill hurried out of the back garden gate at number 10 Downing Street, got into his Daimler motor car, and said, oh, driver, oh, take me out to Oxford as, as rapidly as you can. Oxford being about 70 or 80 miles away from where the bombs were likely to fall. And Winston Churchill would come back the next day, and he would put on his Air Commodore's uniform for some reason, and he would tour the midst east end of London, which was still in flames and smoke, and he would speak to the Cockneys, and they would commiserate with him, and they would say, good old Winnie, sock it back to him. And I heard the voice of racism already at the back of the audience. 
ladies and gentlemen, since the word racism has been uttered, I, I just thought I'd mention that coming to Canada, I don't think I've seen the word racism or racist scattered across so many newspapers that I have here in Canada. It appears to be an obsession at present with your newspapers and your journalists. And I don't know what it is, but I suspect it's the multiculturalism that has been introduced into your country. Winston Churchill knew that London was about to be bombed, and so he took to his heels and he came back the next day and nobody was any the wiser. I just mentioned this. The following year, 1941, we began breaking the secret codes of the SS. They too were using the machine cipher. And by the end of 1941, we had cracked the code of the Ziegerheitspolizei and the Ordnungspolizei, which is the security police and the regular police force. So we were able to read the secret messages being sent back to Berlin by the SS police regiments, which were carrying out their murderous tasks for the, ta uh, the task forces, in fact, uh, behind the German armies advancing across Russia. So on the 13th of September 1941, when Kurt Nelly, where the head of the Ordnance Polizei, sends a message to the commanders of the task forces, saying, please, when you report back to Berlin, giving details of the executions you've been carrying out, don't give any precise statistics, because we always have to assume that it's not impossible that the enemy is able to read these messages. He was, he, he, he was a wise man, Daruga, and he was right, because we were reading the messages, and the task force commanders continue to radio back to Berlin, and there you've got reports of what I said earlier, that not just hundreds, but sometimes thousands of partisans and communists and Jews were being liquidated, machine-gunned, behind the advancing armies as part of an anti-partisan campaign, which was very convenient cover for what they were carrying out. So that definitely happened. But in 1942, the British code breakers cracked the secret code used by seven concentration camp commandants. And that is something, ladies and gentlemen, you've not read in any Canadian newspaper or in any university textbook, because it has to be explained. 1942, we began reading the secret messages sent back to Berlin on a daily basis by the commandant of Buchenwald concentration camp, Dachau, Mauthausen, Auschwitz, and three or four other camps. So we knew what Rudolf Hurst, the commandant of Auschwitz, who was later hanged by the Poles, what he was reporting back to Berlin day by day by day. And these messages were being analyzed by the British Secret Service. Before I tell you what was in them, let me just say that we know this because of a brave British historian called Professor F. H. Hinsley, the official historian of Britain. What I'm about to tell you comes from the official British history of the British Secret Service. Appendix 2, Volume 2, page 669, I think. So it's not just from some gossip colonist or journalist, this is the real McCoy, somebody who had access to the secret archives of the British Secret Service where these messages from Auschwitz are still contained and filed. What did the daily reports from Auschwitz Commandant first reveal? Well, the first thing they revealed is a series of figures. Figure A was the number of prisoners who had arrived the previous day. Prisoners, slave laborers. Auschwitz was a brutal slave labor camp, there's no question. It was one of the most brutal slave labor camps that the Nazis had. Figure A was the number of prisoners who had arrived during the previous 24 hours. Figure B was the number of prisoners who had left the camp during the previous 24 hours. Figure 3 was the number of prisoners on hand in Auschwitz at the end of the day. And there's a big camp. I mean, in this brochure of mine, I've got a photograph of Auschwitz. Take it from there. We now have much better photographs. I have photographs that are as big as this of Auschwitz, where you can see the people walking around on the ground below. Here's Auschwitz, here's the corner, a tiny corner you can see with hundreds and hundreds of barrack-like buildings, 200 of them in all, in a camp called Auschwitz II. Each barrack building housed about 200 prisoners. So you're looking at something like 40 or 50,000 prisoners in that camp at any one time. Those are the three categories. Prisoners who arrived, prisoners who had left, number on hand, and there was a fourth category, which in German was rendered by the words Abgänger aller Art. And in English, I would be strongly tempted to render by the phrase other losses. Other losses, like that book written by my Canadian friend, the liberal novelist and historian Jim Back, other losses. It was, as the British service rightly deduced, the daily figure of mortalities. The number of people who had died, the number of slave laborers who had died in Auschwitz during the previous 24 hours. And the British Secret Service 
analyzed the figures further and, says Professor Hinsley, concluded that by far the greatest part of these fatalities were due to disease. Sensation. Or is it a sensation? It's not really today, because last year Arno Meyer, the Princeton University historian, who's himself a Jew, he wrote a book called Why Did the Heavens Not Darken? And he already anticipated that. He said that in his view, more than half the prisoners in Auschwitz died of natural causes, whatever you can call natural causes and disease. They, in wartime, they died of disease, they died of starvation, they may have even been worked to death, but they weren't executed or gassed or shot, according to Arno Meyer. And the British decoders said, Nearly all of them died by disease. The number, the other, the others, the, 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 the residue, the balance were executed. And the Hertz daily report specifies how they were executed. They were executed by hanging and by shooting. I quote Professor Hinsley again, page 669. There is no references in the Auschwitz, there is no reference in the Auschwitz daily telegrams to any gassings. And you would imagine that this sensational discovery by the British official historian should really have made, well, not front page headlines, but it should have been taken notice of by journalists, reporters, and historians around the world. But nobody else has drawn attention to it. And even Hinsley has only tucked it away in appendix to the back of his volume. But what a sensation it is. No gassings at Auschwitz were reported, even by the commandant himself, reporting back to Berlin. And yet the legend has it that this was the main job in Auschwitz, that it was a death camp, a factory of death, where millions of people arrived on the trains in open cattle trucks, were unloaded, stripped of their clothing, and then channeled through to the gas chambers and then into the crematorium. What do the Russian documents tell us, bearing these English documents in mind? Well, as part of President Gorbachev's glasnost, on September the 21st last year, the news agency TASS in Moscow released the rather startling fact that they had discovered in, a, in an archives, an unnamed archives in Moscow, I suspect it was the archives of the KGB, they had discovered the missing death books of Auschwitz and they had discovered the missing card index of Auschwitz, listing all the prisoners. This fact sent a shudder down many a spine around the world because there is many a person who has been drawing benefits as an Auschwitz survivor who is not pleased to know that there is a complete card index of all the prisoners in Auschwitz. Eli Wiesel, for example, the Nobel Prize winner for literacy, Eli Wiesel has stopped claiming that he is an Auschwitz survivor. He is now a survivor of Dachau, I think, or is it some other? But more sensational than the discovery of the card indexes from uh, the Moscow archives is the release of the death books of Auschwitz. We know about the existence of death books in concentration camps because in the very first Nuremberg trial, the death books of Mauthausen concentration camp were introduced as evidence, and they weren't all that spectacular. They were just meticulous listings of the prisoners who had died. And so it is in the case of Auschwitz. Let me tell you what they are. They are 46 volumes very large volumes, kept like registers, listing the names, all the names of the prisoners who had died on any particular day, listing the time of death, the cause of death, where they had died, the nationality. These 46 death books are in the Moscow archives, if they haven't already been returned to Adolfson in Germany now, I think they probably have. Significant for us is the fact that for the year 1942 they are complete, for the year 1943 they are almost complete, for the year 1944, they are only partially complete. They list, ladies and gentlemen, a total of 76,000 names. 76,000 people whose deaths are registered in the Auschwitz death books from all causes. So that gives us something like a bottom line figure for the deaths in Auschwitz concentration camp. Very much less than 4 million, much less even still than 1 million. What can we say even about the 76,000? Well, it's probably not complete. If we were to take into account the missing volumes of 1942 and 1940, uh, 1943 and 1944, then perhaps it might come up as high as 100,000 fatalities spread in, in, in Auschwitz. Well, that is a crime. These are innocent people. 
These are innocent people who had no business to be in Auschwitz. This was a war, but they were kidnapped as slave laborers. They were innocent men, women, and children who had no business to be there. And if I am asked, as an Englishman, what I consider to be the major crime of World War II, or of any war, it's not genocide, which I think is an artificial notion of a crime. It's innocenticide. The killing of innocent people is the crime in any war, it is gentlemen. Because to say that genocide is the crime rather implies that it makes it a crime to kill somebody because of his race. And that's not what the crime is. The crime is killing somebody who is innocent of any crime. It's the crime of killing somebody who shouldn't be killed for any reason whatsoever. Innocent by any uh, categorization or any qualification at all. And that's what these 100,000 people in, Aus in Auschwitz 1942, 1943, and 1944 were. They were innocent, and yet they died under extreme circumstances. But how many of them were killed? If we take Arno Meyer's words, more than half died of natural causes, then we are probably right to say that, say, 50,000 people were killed, and the rest died of natural causes in Auschwitz. If we go by the British decrypts, the intercepted and decoded British messages of the commandant of Auschwitz, then, of course, it's going to be a vanishingly small number, proportion of that 100,000 who were executed or killed. The rest, I quote British documents, the rest died of disease, primarily of typhus, because Auschwitz in Central Europe was at the heart of an appalling plague of typhus that swept Europe, that ravaged it like the black plagues that, that went through the whole of Europe in, in the 17th century. Two or three years, the whole of Central Europe was in the grip of this typhus plague that was being transmitted by rats and by life, by lice. The only way it could be combated was by disinfestation using the most draconic methods. And the Germans went about it with all their grisly efficiency. The prisoners who arrived had their clothing taken off them. The clothing was put in a gas chamber in Auschwitz and subjected to cyanide impregnation to kill the lice. A little gas chamber that you can still see there, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to Auschwitz today. It looks like a gas chamber. It's got gas tight doors, it's got an armor plated peephole, too small for people, but it's got the railings that go in and it's got the steel kind of jig outside on which the clothing was loaded to be carried into the gas chamber to be disinfested with the cyanide gas because the clothing was going to be recycled. The prisoners came into the bathhouse on the dirty side they went into the bathhouse and were showered and came out on the clean side where they were given their striped convict garb. Their hair was cut off because of the mice in the hair. Things begin to fit now, don't they? Anne Frank died of the typhus plague. She had been in Auschwitz with her father and her sister. She was evacuated from Auschwitz when the camp was about to be overrun and taken to Bergen-Belsen, and there Anne Frank died of typhus. A lot of British officers died of typhus when they went to Bergen, Belsen and Buchenwald after the war, including a couple of code breakers from the British Code Breaking Institute who went there as interpreters. They too died of typhus. We have to know this. You can see this gas chamber that I just mentioned for disinfesting the clothing, the fumigation chamber in Auschwitz. If you go there, it's not shown to the tourists. And the reason for that becomes quite evident when you see the gas chamber that they do show to the tourists because then you would be entitled to ask, why does this gas chamber for the clothing have all the safety precautions and the gas tight doors and the ventilation? Whereas the one where apparently millions of people were killed has no gas tight doors, no ventilation system, no blue stain on the walls left by the hydrocyanic acid, which you can see in the little gas chamber. All these things you can see. In fact, if you go there and look at the gas chamber that's shown to the tourists, I think you're entitled to be most skeptical. It's got a wooden door at both ends. Under the wooden door is a gap that high, ladies and gentlemen. Those gas chambers are drafty in Auschwitz. They're not, they're not gas tight at all. There's a, gla a glass window in one of the doors, made of ordinary window glass, that any prisoner could have knocked out with his elbow if he wanted to. Well, we don't have to worry about that gas chamber to show to the tourists anymore because Fanti Czech Pieper, the museum and archive director in Auschwitz, now admits that it is a fake. How about this? A friend of mine, the head of the, the Department of History in Freiburg University in Germany, I was having a bottle of wine with him on September the 3rd this year, down in Freiburg, 
I've been working in the archives, and as the German historians are in private, they like to meet me and pick my brains, and we exchange knowledge about where things are and what our views are. And Professor Bernd Martin, the head of the history department, with 40,000 students under him, he was saying to me, he's left wing a little. Bernd Martin said, oh, I think you're wrong about the gas chambers. You know, there are gas chambers in Auschwitz. I've been there three or four times, he said. And it was there to reproach me for not going to Auschwitz. And I admit it, I've not been to Auschwitz. Why should I? Within five years from now, all the historians will admit that Auschwitz is unimportant. Auschwitz would have sunk from the ocean's surface, leaving a little trail of bubbles. And all that Auschwitz will be of interest to us, the historians as a whole, will be why millions of people could have been so gullible to believe it without any evidence. It'll be a footnote in history. That is my view. Believe me, my views usually come true. So that's why I haven't bothered to go to Auschwitz. Life is too short. But I've seen the videos that people have taken of the gaps between the doors. Beneath the doors, I've seen the results of the forensic tests on the walls of the so-called gas chambers there. And the forensic tests on the walls of the little real gas chamber, which showed, I guess, the real content of cyanide in the walls of 1,040 milligrams per one kilogram of cement. So you can do these tests. Bernd Martin, this professor in Freiburg, had been there, and he said, you know, I've been there and I've seen it. There were gas chambers in Auschwitz, you're totally wrong. And he says, Frantisek Pieper, the new museum director, the one who replaced the communist director, Casimir Smuller, a year ago, he meant, it's interesting, isn't it? The lie was kept afloat by the communist leadership of Poland until a year ago when Smuller was sacked, and almost immediately the, mon the monument to the four million was destroyed, because that was a lie. And Frantisek Pieper said to uh, um, Professor Martin, yes, of course, well, you, you've got to realize that not only this gas chamber here, there's the other gas chambers in Auschwitz too, in Birkenau which is three or four miles away from here. And then Professor Martin told me he spotted what other people had spotted, the gaps beneath the doors, the fact that the square holes in the roof where allegedly the cyanide had been tipped in by SS officers on top, as the eyewitnesses had described after the war, that these holes had apparently been installed after the war also to make the building fit the eyewitness descriptions which isn't the way that things really happen, of course. In fact, if you go there and look for yourselves, you will see, ladies and gentlemen, how these holes have been put in the ceiling after the war, because they're typical Polish craftsmanship. They, I mean, in one place, they tried to drill a hole through the concrete ceiling uh, with pneumatic drills, and they came across the reinforcing steel bars in the concrete. So they left it. They just left the hole there. They didn't fit it in again. They just left it there as proof of how they tried to make a hole after the place had been built and then gave it up. And it shouldn't take in anyone, but it's taken in generations of historians, including my friend Bernd Martin, almost. Because he then said to me, uh, I, I said to Franti J. Pieper, uh, you can't expect us to believe that this building here is a real gas chamber, though can you? And Pieper admitted that no, the gas chamber shown to the tourists in Auschwitz is a fake built after the war for the benefit of the tourists. And so is the crematorium. How about that? An admission from the horse's mouth that the gas chamber in Auschwitz, shown to the tourists, is a fake, built for the benefit of the tourists, and so is the crematorium, which of course should have been obvious to anyone who looked at it, because if you look at the crematorium, you'll see there's no connection between the retorts or the furnaces in the crematorium and the chimney standing next to it. The chimney is just a dummy built after the war. You can see that because there isn't a trace of soot on it either. But people don't spot these things. It never occurred to them, it never occurred to me, I must admit, to insist that chemical tests be carried out on the buildings, because it is too emotionalized. So why doesn't Professor, I mean, why didn't uh, Professor Bernd Martin ask the obvious question? If you've got the real gas chambers in Auschwitz too, Birkenau, why don't you show those to the tourists? Why build the dummies here three miles away? It never occurred to him to ask the question, and sometimes one has to ask, who are the dummies? The gas chambers shown to the tourists, or the tourists themselves who believe in the gas chambers. One thing is quite plain to me, ladies and gentlemen, having cognizance of what is in the British intercepts, taking cognizance of what the Russian uh, death books of Auschwitz reveal, we can put the truth about Auschwitz in the following little, extremely tasteless capsule. More people died on the back seat of Senator Edward Kennedy's car in Chappaquiddick than died in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. Oh, cool. So how does 
the historian of Benjamin survived? Well, the answer is that the historians, unable to find any evidence, have lied and cheated and faked and defrauded and embezzled and swindled and counterfeited evidence. And I can give you evidence of this. Take the case of Professor Eberhard Jeckel, the head of the history department at the University of Stuttgart, another famous German historian. There's his famous smiling face on all the television screens. He was one of the historians who said he wasn't going to sit at the same table as me. With good reason, ladies and gentlemen, because I see through their rotten tricks. Eberhard Jeckel and a journalist called Lea Roche, German journalist, between them produced a four-part television series, which I suppose eventually will come to Canada. Watch for it. A television series with the German name Der Tod ein Meister aus Deutschland. Death, a master from Germany. And you can imagine what kind of film it was. There were German soldiers bayoneting and killing and plundering and murdering and pillaging and looting. There was a <coughs> slime caught on the German people and indirectly, of course, on European people, which is why I'm concerned about it. Slime caught on the Germans by two of their own historians, Professor Jekyll and Lea Roche. And one of the scenes they showed, ladies and gentlemen, was this photograph here. You can't see it at the back, but at the front. I'll describe to you what it shows. No, better. I will say what Eberhard Jekyll says it shows. It's a scene in Romania, according to Professor Jekyll, of tens of thousands of pitiful Jews being loaded aboard open cattle trucks for shipment to the gas chambers at Auschwitz. This was the voiceover on the television series, part two in the 35th minute of the transmission, as this photograph was flashed on the screens of millions of television sets across Germany. Tens of thousands of pitiless Jews being loaded aboard open cattle trucks for shipment to the gas chambers in Auschwitz. Well, I just happen to have a copy of the original photograph, and here it is in my left hand. You'll notice that bits have been cut off the photograph shown on television, and bits have been retouched. What has been cut off the photograph shown on television are people standing around the platform, old women and, and, and the like carrying shopping bags, which doesn't really go well with a pitiful scene of 10,000 Jews being loaded aboard an open cattle train bound for the gas ovens. You'll notice that on this train here, on the other platform, the upper deck windows have been blacked out on the television version because upper deck windows wouldn't have gone well on a picture of a train allegedly being shipped out of Romania where they didn't have double deck trains and didn't exist in Germany as far as I know during the Second World War either. Yet here they are in this photograph and it's been blacked out. You'll notice that the original photograph has no sign of any guards anywhere. So I, they must have been very do docile victims indeed to have allowed themselves to be packed into open cattle trucks for an unknown destination without the sign of any... Well, okay, well, what does this photograph show? This photograph, ladies and gentlemen, is from the photographic archives of Hamburg Central Railway Station. It's Hamburg, as you can tell by looking at this wall here, which is quite a well-known wall in Hamburg, and the other train is a, a local train going off to Lübeck. And the actual photograph, taken in 1946, during the British occupation of Hamburg, one year after the war's over, shows German civilians loaded, or in fact willingly boarding, coal trains, empty coal trains, bound for the Ruhr on a shopping expedition, a so-called hamsterfahrt. We have a person here who wants to say something, but I would request you, sir, to wait until we have a discussion after the pause. Otherwise, you will fatally floor my, my, my flow of, uh, of, of information. This photograph, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, is, if you go to Hamburg, have a look in the intercity restaurant at the Hamburg Central Railway Station. You'll find this photograph hanging on the wall of the restaurant as a display of nostalgia of post-war Germany. I wrote a letter, of course, to Eberhard Jekyll, saying, Dear Professor Jekyll, I do earnestly request you in future to do your research in the archives and not in railway station restaurants. <laughs> but this, unfortunately, is the... Okay, we have an urgent question. Yes. in concentration camps in Holland and elsewhere? And the answer is yes. But that's quite right. We can take a discussion. I mean, it's, it is a valid point, but I did make... Well, if you do wait until the end of this talk, we will go into the 
these figures and the whole statistical question. I have made it quite plain. It's, it's quite all right. It's quite all right to have this kind of discussion, but I would prefer to have it in the discussion of the rather than in, 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 the, in the middle of the actual talk. You see, we are faced, and this gentleman is quite right in one respect, we're faced with three important questions concerning the whole of the Auschwitz legend. And it is a legend. I'm not going to call it a lie, because calling it a lie implies that the people who tell us about it now are willfully telling an untruth. They're not. They're repeating a legend which appears plausible to them, rather like a religion. It's a legend. But there are three important questions which arise if it was a legend. The first question is, how do we explain the eyewitnesses, isn't it? The second question is, rather, as this gentleman was saying, well, what happened to all the Jews who vanished? And the third question is, where did the legend come from in the first place? I'll take them in reverse order. Where did the legend come from? Last time I was here, 18 months ago, I set it out in some detail with the documents, but I'll paraphrase it quickly now. In 1942, the British cabinet received a message from the head of the World Jewish Congress in Geneva, a man called Gerhard Wiechner, alleging that in Hitler's headquarters, the decision had just been taken to liquidate millions of European Jews in special gas chambers in the concentration camps which had already been built. And the request was made to the British government to pass on this information to the headquarters of the World Jewish Congress in New York. Whether it was passed on or not, I don't know. But what is important is that the British government's psychological warfare seized on this little tidbit and boosted it into a major propaganda lie against Germany. A grotesque lie. And I'm quoting there the words of the head of the Joint Intelligence Committee in Britain, Victor Cavendish Bentley, Lord Portland, who died three or four months ago. A grotesque lie which he compared with the story that German soldiers in World War I had cut off the hands of Belgian children or Belgian babies. In World War I, we used that story too, of course. We made great mileage out of it. But two or three years after World War I was over, our brave Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons and apologized to the German people for having told that lie. It did a lot of harm to the British psychological warfare effort in World War I. And Victor Cavendish Bentinck in World War II was concerned that by propagating the legend about the gas chambers, which was likely to be unmasked at any moment, we might be damaging our very cleverly constructed and contrived psychological warfare effort. He rather thought we'd been hijacked by ethnic minorities who, for their own causes, for their own purposes. So he advised the British government to go soft on that particular propaganda. So that, in my view, is a possible or even a probable cause, probable origin, of where the legend of the gas chambers came from. What about the eyewitnesses? The second question. People say it to me again and again, today two television reporters, all week newspaper reporters, but there are hundreds of eyewitnesses, Mr. Irving, who, who what? Saw it happening? No. None of the eyewitnesses actually saw it happening, but they knew about it. They knew about the gas chambers in Auschwitz. I think the only eyewitness who claims to have seen it happening was a man called Kurt Gerstein, who wrote a report about it for the French and French captivity. He wrote seven different versions of the report before he committed suicide in his prison cell in French captivity. And the Gerstein Report has now been, to my mind, and I know it's an, a controversial subject, the Gerstein Report has been deflated, shall we say, as a historical document. Eyewitnesses are a very suspect source of information. They're useful for an author if you want color, but they're not useful if you want substance, because eyewitnesses are notoriously emotional, jumpy, forgetful, imaginative, and they are motivated by a uniquely human uh, emotion, which is the emotion of pride. If you are in a concentration camp, if you are a survivor, if you are a survivor of Auschwitz, and there are thousands and thousands upon thousands of survivors of Auschwitz around today, and I'm glad for every one of them. A remarkable fact, of course, that on the one hand, we're told the Nazis had this dedicated program to exterminate all the Jews they got their hands on, and on the other hand, there are thousands who were in the jaws of death in Auschwitz and yet survived. And yet, if you were in Auschwitz, and somebody says to you, Mr. Irving, what did you see? I can't say I spent three years in Auschwitz peeling potatoes, or digging anti-tank trenches, or whatever, or working in the rubber factory. That's not what my listeners want to hear me say. Pride demands that I must have been at the center of events, or at least near the center of events. It's a human nature, and so people 
took themselves near the central heads in Auschwitz, which was the gas chambers. They'd been taught about it for 45 years. The gas chambers were all that Auschwitz was about. And so pride dictates to them that they relate first in hazy detail, then in outline, and there with more confidence, because they too have seen the Hollywood movies and the Holocaust series on television. They know what a gassing looks like. And it's oh so embarrassing when years later, in 1976, I think, the American government released the 48 photographs that were taken, magnificent photographs of Auschwitz concentration camp, and suddenly the stories go pop, pop, pop. For example, there was a man who wrote his memoirs in which he describes, he's Hungarian, he describes arriving in Auschwitz concentration camp on 25th of August 1944. He arrived just in time to witness a mass extermination of 20,000 prisoners who had arrived during the previous 24 hours. They were exterminated by various means according to his memoirs, and then they were burned on huge open funeral pyres. The horizon was blotted out by the smoke. And then mass graves were dug to bury the ashes in. And the unfortunate thing for this gentleman was that that very afternoon, the American Air Force had a spotter plane flying over Auschwitz. It was August. Brilliant, clear, central European weather. You could see the people walking around on the streets below. Needless to say, none of what he described in his eyewitness testimony. And I can give you one very good parallel here. Even if we were inclined to believe the Auschwitz stories, I don't see any reason to, because we have an equal volume of stories from eyewitnesses in Dachau concentration camp near Munich, who claim that they are people of intellect, people of education, doctors, officers, policemen, who claim to have seen gassing operations going on in Dachau. Same kind of thing, gas chambers, selection, and all the rest of it. And yet now no reputable historian accepts that there were gas chambers in Dachau. The West German government insisted that the Americans dismantle the, the gas chamber that they had installed there for the benefit of tourists after the war. The American troops who occupied uh, 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 Munich at that time, they had kind of titivated up a, a building there and called it a gas chamber for the tourists. So the American government made them take down the signs because they said it was a fraud. And the American government and all the German historians admit that there was no gas chamber in Dachau. And yet you've got a file full of eyewitness stories of gas chambers there too. So the eyewitnesses are, and again I'm going to be tasteless, I think they're an interesting case for psychological analysis. Why do people say they saw things? But you cannot rest history, particularly because there's nothing in the archives. The only documents that exist in the archives have now been put together in a magnificent documentation, not by us, not by the dissident historians or the revisionists, as we're sometimes called, but by the Holocaust historians. They've issued a magnificent documentation authored by a Frenchman called Jean-Claude Pressac. And I really take off my hat to him. He's done a magnificent piece of research. He's worked in the Polish archives, the Auschwitz archives, the Russian archives, the German archives, of course. And he's produced a book this big with blueprints and diagrams and photographs of Auschwitz of the barracks, the buildings, the crematoria, everything to do with Auschwitz, proving that everything was there except the gas chambers. He's proved everything else. Press act to his honor when he's shown the gas chambers that the tourists are shown, spots the immediate in the floors, and he too says that he has to assume that these buildings are there only for purposes of display, because they cannot have been gas chambers at the time. But he accepts that there were gas chambers because there are two or three German documents let me tell you what these documents are, because sooner or later, they will come up against us. They are the last shots that the battleship Auschwitz can still fire at us. The first document mentions Verglasung's keller. It's a document written by a German engineer at Auschwitz to an architect, in which the word Verglasung's keller is quite clearly there, and the content is something like this. Because the concreting work on the roof over the Weichen keller, which is the mortuary attached to the cemetery, but the crematorium is not complete, we're going to have to use the Fergarsen's keller for a while instead. Fergarsen's keller, you can translate that as gassing cellar. But those of you who are German here, or those of you who know German, will know that one idiosyncrasy of the German language, ladies and gentlemen, is that many German words can have many meanings. The same word can have many meanings. And the word Fergaser or Fergarsen is an example of that. It, mean, it can mean to gas, it can mean to gasify. Those of you who have German motor cars have a Fergaser. It's the carburetor. And it's as simple as that. And as a cremation process in a crematorium involves the production of very high temperatures to cremate human bodies, human remains, 
they have a high combustion principle there as well, which probably, I'm not a cremation expert, needs a fair garzons keller. You could certainly identify it on the blueprint. It has nothing to do with a gas chamber in the gassing sense. And I'll come back to tell you the reason why I am certain that that document means the one thing and not the other in a minute. Because there's another document that Pressag has produced which appears even more damning for the dissidents, for the revisionists. And this is a German document which uses the word Vergasungsoperationen, gassing operations. Now, how do you get around that one? This document is signed by the Commandant himself, by Rudolf Huss, and is circulated to all the staff at Auschwitz of any rank and consequence. And the document says roughly the following. A number of members of the staff of this camp have suffered personal injury from failing to observe the safety precautions during gassing operations. And he then goes on to say that he can't accept the consequences. The staff have failed to observe the security precautions. It's their own funeral, so to speak. And he urges the staff in future to adhere to the safety precautions down to the last instance. Now, when you first look at that document, as I'm sure Jean-Claude Pressac did, with his limited expertise, you are taken in by it. You think this document can only be, it's, it's, it's the $60,000 document, which proves that the Germans were involved in gassing operations in Auschwitz, which is what the whole Holocaust legend is about. But it doesn't. Gassing operations in this document, and I'm convinced of this, and I'll explain why in a moment, refer purely to the gassing operations to fumigate building after building after building in this immense Auschwitz complex. Here it is again, you can see. An immense complex of two or three hundred barrack buildings, all infested by people who've arrived from all over Europe, and the Germans are confronted with an appalling outbreak of typhus, which is wiping out not only the slave laborers, who they don't care about, but their own officers like flies. So they're gassing the buildings methodically. If you buy a, build, if you buy a house in, in the southern states of the United States, ladies and gentlemen, the first question you have to ask the estate agent, the real tour, is when was it last tented? When was it last tented? B wooden frame houses there, you have tarpaulin sheets thrown over the whole building, and then the fumigators go in wearing special protective clothing, adhering to the safety precautions, and they open poison gas canisters to kill the rats, the lice, the termites above all. And the building is tented for two or three days long. And so it was in Auschwitz. Tons upon tons of cyanide gas in the proprietary form Cyclone B was sent to Auschwitz and the other camps for fumigating the buildings. The jobs were carried out by German staff, and occasionally they went into a building before it had pro been properly ventilated afterwards, and then they suffered unfortunate consequences themselves. And that is what the Hearst document is about. And the proof of that, and the proof of the previous document being harmless and innocuous documents, is as follows. I've shown the first document, in fact, during the Ernst Zündel trial in Toronto, when I was accepted by the court as an export historical uh, expert, historical uh, expert uh, witness. The prosecution put the first document, the fake answer was kind of on the screen and asked for my comments. And I'd given my comments about the fact that it was uh, obviously to do with the combustion process. And they can't, the, the, the picture was off the screen and I said, excuse me, can we please have the document back on the screen? Because it occurred to me that what was significant was not what was on the document, but what was not. A security classification. A secret stamp. We're told that this Holocaust, this gassing of millions of Jews was the most secret operation in the whole of the Third Reich. So secret that most Germans never knew anything about it until the war was over and then they were told by, their, by, their, by the Allies. So secret that Adolf Hitler personally ordered all documents destroyed. And yet here is a document which has no secret stamp on it. Believe me, ladies and gentlemen, having worked in the archives for 30 years, I know that German documents are littered with security classifications. And if you say, all right, but this was a carbon copy, perhaps they omitted to stamp the carbon copy, then I can tell you the following. German civil service practice requires that every official document, every official letter and so on, has to have what's called a Briefbuch number, a letter register number, which is something like 23789, a Blick 43, which is the year, followed by the security classification, GEH, Geheim, GKDOS, Geheimer Commander Zahar, top military secret, Geheimer Reichsacher, top state secret on civilian documents. So you would have known just from the brief book number whether it was security classified or not, and the answer was it wasn't. No, it wasn't even confidential. 
These documents, which the Holocaust historians regard as cardinal kingpins of their case, are documents, in fact, of a janitorial level, I would say. Literally, they're concerned with the fumigation of the building, nothing more and nothing less. What is the evidence of the, the goes to the, the legend? Was there, in fact, a Hitler order for the killing of millions of Jews? Well, I've shown this document before, and I'll show it to you again. It's the one that the Holocaust historians can't get out of. From the files of the German Ministry of Justice, the wartime Ministry of Justice, a document signed by the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Justice, a man of about the same importance as your Secretary of State, Jerry Weiner, in this country, but probably a considerably more intelligence. Vice Minister Weiner. I, I mentioned that, but some people have been asking me why I'm not charging tax on the books at the back, and the answer is I want not a cent to go to the Canadian government where it will finance Mr. Jerry Weiner's smears on me. <laughs> this is from the files of the German Ministry of Justice, 1942, after the Lanze Conference, which we're told is when the decision was taken. After the, in the middle of 1942, when in fact we're told the Holocaust was at its height. Yet here we have, Ice Minister Lammers informs me that the Fuhrer of the Minister of Justice, Ice Minister Lammers, who is the head of the civil service, the prime minister in, in a dictatorship, Ice Minister Lammers informs me that the Fuhrer has repeatedly ordained that he wants the solution of the Jewish problem postponed until after the war is over. I won't find that document quoted in any of the history books, ladies and gentlemen, because it doesn't fit in with the modern theories. And what about that 50,000 total in Auschwitz? It is a crime, as I said, it's 50,000 innocent people being killed in some way or other. 50,000 people killed by the Germans, the Nazis, in the concentration camp Auschwitz in three years, 1942, 1943, and 1944. It's a huge crime, about the size of the number of people that we British killed in Hamburg in one night. You've got to, as the Germans say, you've got to compare crime with crime. And this is precisely what my opponents don't want. They want that crime to remain as the only monstrous crime this century. In fact, this millennium, where all the other crimes fade away into insignificance. And this is not conducive to a healing of relations between nations. So if you ask me why I do this, it is because of that. I believe in friendship between nations. I believe in friendship between races. I believe in destroying and disposing of that which divides us. When people say, Mr. Erdogan, why do you do this for the Germans? Why do you write these books for Germany? I answer, I don't do it for Germany or the Germans. I do it for the truth because I'm a historian. And Winston Churchill himself said the job of a historian is to find out what happened and why. And that's what I've tried to do here this evening, ladies and gentlemen, by destroying the battleship Auschwitz by sinking that battleship Auschwitz so that in a few years from now it leaves just a little trail of bubbles. I hope that I've done something to bring nations closer together because it will four or five years from now you'll hear my, my opponents, a historian, saying, well, even if Auschwitz was just a slave labor camp with no gas chambers, what about the others? But that, of course, is the second line of defense. And once the army has fallen back on the second line of defense, they are in retreat. I think, ladies and gentlemen, they're in retreat already. The fact that you have difficulties coming here this evening, the fact that I have difficulties speaking to intelligent audiences in Canada, the fact that universities across the country are prevailed upon to cancel invitations to me to lecture students is proof to me that I have the opposition on the run. I leave it to you yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, to judge well whether the evidence justifies my hypothesis, the hypothesis I put to you this evening, the hypothesis that probably Auschwitz was one of the war's most gruesome slave labor camps but no more and no less. Thank you. Well, that is the end of the lecture part of this evening's uh, uh, events, ladies and gentlemen, but I am going to come back here after about 15 minutes interval Ten minutes to give you time to draw a breath and get some water or whatever is at the back or outside. And uh, meanwhile, I'll be at uh, my table at the back there. And um, I will answer questions as honest as I can. And I do hope we have a lot of opponents here so we, we can hear finally what the opposing case is. Thank you.
discussion.
sites or locations. And I think this is acceptable. Because after all, we are only held by Auschwitz now. Auschwitz is the capital ship of the enemy fleet. The battleship Auschwitz, which I previously referred to. And if in the film Hermann Buchs War Remembrance on television, you see all the uh, star studded cast being shepherded in the gas chambers, the gas chambers of those Auschwitz. We were told, in fact, that that film was filmed on location in Auschwitz, but believe it or not, the gas chamber wasn't in Auschwitz. They filmed that scene in Hollywood for uh, the reasons that you can now, now define. Um, so I felt it right to deal with any of the Auschwitz in secure knowledge that if the, my opponents decide to fall back on the second line of defense and say, what about the other camps? That means that they have given up Auschwitz, that they do accept that they were wrong on that. And of course, if they accept that they were wrong on that, then the whole of the rest of their case becomes very hollow indeed. But this is purely debating tactics, if you will. I'm sure that a proper historian doing a proper history of the, the whole of the Holocaust would have to look at all the other camps too, but I'm very confident they will come up with the same results on the other camps as well. Uh, why didn't you deal with your uh, third point? Will you deal with it now? What happened to the disappeared Jews? Yeah, very good. Why didn't I deal with the third point? Remember, I, the three standard questions, where did the legend come from, and what happened to the Jews, and how do you explain the eyewitnesses? What happened to the Jews? Quite rightly, like the gentleman who left, a lot of people say that many, many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews vanished during World War II, and they must have gone somewhere. Well, I accept this. This is a powerful argument. A lot of them did die in concentration camps. There's no, no denying that. They died from all causes. A lot of them died outside concentration camps from all causes. A lot of Germans died outside concentration camps from all causes. Over 100,000 died in Dresden from air raids. And a lot of those people who died in Dresden were refugees who had been evacuated from concentration camps in the East in Silesia, which is where, where our space was. This is a possible thing that could have happened. I know that my German speaking audiences are very unhappy when I read in great detail from eyewitness accounts of the extermination, massacre, murder of Jews in Lithuania and Latvia. Outside Riga, I have some appalling eyewitness descriptions by German generals. And I don't discuss them. Very good point. Why are these credible? Let me explain to you. These eyewitnesses who are not relating it to the benefit of the outside world, what they've seen years later. These are, for example, a German general who has been taken prisoner by the British, and he has been locked up in an English country mansion. And then, in a subdued whisper, he talks to his fellow prisoners about the appalling things that he has seen two or three years ago behind the, the lines outside Riga that he personally eyewitnessed the mass killing of thousands of Jews, he presumed they were Jews, just lining up, waiting patiently to be shot into a big pits that had been dug. And he described this without knowing that every word he said in a subdued whisper of his fellow prisoners was being taken down by concealed British microphones. And the verbatim transcripts in the original journal of what this, this man and others who were also present said, describing the scene uh, just been released in the British archives two or three years ago, and they made horrible descriptions indeed. My German eyewitness is credible and Jewish eyewitness is not. Let me just repeat what I was saying, which is to say that this same German general, two years later, went into witness box at Nuremberg and swore blindly on a stack of eyeballs that no, he hadn't seen anything. He had been told about it by an officer sent down the road to see it. But I tell you that in the version that he relates to his friends in prison camp, he says, I can see it before my mind's eye now. There was one particularly beautiful Jewish girl wearing a flame red dress. And the people who had the machine guns were screaming taunts at them, shouting, look, here comes another beautiful Jewish girl. Just watch this one. That man has not been told it by somebody who sent on the road. He sees it himself. But it's interesting that when he came to give evidence to witness what suddenly transplanted himself when I was away. But I agree. You have to be selected. And perhaps I'm being totally unreasonably selective in which witnesses I believe and which I don't. And in this particular case, I say to myself, this German general is probably telling the truth because he is describing something that could possibly be held against him. Whereas the other witnesses are describing something which will operate and militate only in their favor. Do you accept that as like No. No. Okay. Thank you.
thanks, Don. And you've invited me to, through Mr. McDonald, to have debate with you. So may I presume and take a few extra minutes? You know, now, first of all, I the 
the fact that Margaret Mitchell, who was a member of Parliament for Bank of East, wrote a letter to the board here, putting pressure on the board here, pleading with them to cancel the contract, which of course used to keep the Bali contract, I think in England is certainly a criminal offence, but even in Canada it's only a court. They used to keep the Bali contract, but still it's a malfeasance. Um, six Ottawa district members of Parliament uh, visited the company board of the Congress Centre and put pressure on them. I don't know the names, I'm just reporting what the Indian Jewish News and so proudly announced a few days ago. They also said that they should put pressure on the Vancouver Television Station, which had asked uh, to leave for an interview, and they had prevailed upon the Vancouver Television Station to cancel its interview invitation for me, and as the Indian Jewish News said, the television station complied. It is a criminal case to the spread of malicious propaganda, calculated to incite racial violence, etc., etc. Yes, it is a criminal case. A criminal offense, as our barrister friend points out, to spread malicious uh, information calculated to cause racial discontent. It's also a criminal offense to spread false news, uh, for example, the Canadian newspapers and the Canadian. Uh, Jewish Congress has been repeatedly describing me as a self-described fascist, and I challenge them to say whether the last 30 years I've ever so described myself. But I'm not going to get into that kind of mud swinging mash, so I can even walk my back in space and never get into a pissing mash with a skunk. <laughs> between the dramatization of the Jewish suffering in Europe and the establishment of the state of Israel. Is there any relationship between the dramatization of Jewish suffering in Europe and the establishment of the state of Israel? Well, I'm sure there is a, a big link because uh, we are all so overburdened with a feeling of guilt for the Holocaust, whether we're German or not. Anybody who lived in Europe in that corner of the world was white skinned and was involved and didn't intervene to help the Jews. I mean, this is the argument now, not only the Nazis, but also the Germans, not in the Germans, but also the French. In the French, but also the Norwegians and the Danish, and anybody who happened to be in Europe at the time is responsible for the, for the six million. And therefore, we all have a moral duty to help the state of Israel. I'm sure this is all part of the But I, I really don't want to get involved in, in discussing the political implications of it, uh, because, as our president <coughs> rightly said, uh, it's a criminal offense to discuss certain things and request certain I will come back to Andrew again. Just a comment, I was, uh, I have a, I hadn't brought a copy of my account. No, no, this is a civil fish my account. <laughs> no, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying, like, I was just looking at it, and it, you know, it says, um, call, says about the Jews, that they're a parasite.
website and um, I was just examining it. I'm not saying I've read this. I have no read this. But I wanted to ask you, have you read my book? Why is there a read this? Okay, I want to ask you, do you read my book? And does Hitler address the Jewish question in my book? And does he call it parasites and uh, give a scathing, um, you know, thing about it? I think that he will find it. He makes a number of anti-Semitic remarks in my account, and that surely doesn't surprise us. Except that I don't think that my account is such an important insight to Hitler's thinking as uh, some of his other writings, uh, his newspaper articles and what is brought out of Hitler's second book, which is a far more important um, document, because Hitler certainly wrote that of Hitler's second book. Uh, you know, whereas my account is uh, partly regurgitated, partly put together by his fellow prisoners in Lansbury Prison, and we're not quite sure what's really out of Hitler and what isn't. So it isn't a, a rock bottom. Solid source away from something that's in the TV. But I agree there are a number of nasty remarks about the Jews in my country, which is one very good reason to say that. Uh, but on the other hand, he doesn't say I'm going to put them all in the gas chambers. So it's rather irrelevant for an analysis of the whole world. Yes? You've seen uh, great schedules, private sector, the choice of the British evidence, oil, oil pipeline, movements, and things like that. I've seen train schedules, oil pipeline, and shipments of oil and fuel and so on. I've seen people doing ingenious calculations based on them, but uh, without the, the cardinal evidence you're looking for, smoking gun well and cardinal the sea, I think it's very, very dangerous to, to try and extrapolate. It's rather like people who say several tons of cyclone really cyanide pellets were sent to our ships, therefore they were used for gas in June, so you can't do that. It's, um, it's an irresponsible use of evidence. And uh, I know that opinions in the area as to what is responsible and what is irresponsible use of evidence, but I think that that kind of thing is irresponsible use of evidence, particularly in the light of the new evidence we have, uh, like the uh, decrypted, deciphered um, daily reports of the commandant person. That's about as clear an evidence you can get. Those reports by first say that most of the people are dying of disease and that the executions are only by a fire and squad and hanging. And I said, you know, you should believe it. And they were top state secret. They were sent in one of the highest codes that they ever had in Germany. I think we'll take a few more questions and then we'll find it out. Yes, sir. Excuse me. Are you familiar with? Yes, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Irving. Uh, are, you, are you familiar with? Are you familiar with Arthur Butts, the author? In fact, it was published in 1977, I know that, but it had the misfortune, or I had the misfortune, that his book published in the same month as my, I don't think the biography, so the malicious newspapers were used to walk side by side. But I've never read this book now. He has the advantage that I have that neither of us has ever learned history academically. Uh, in fact, the only examination I ever failed at school was history. I mean, I, I, I never learned, I never qualified as a historian. And I'm sure the best of us, he was like an even engineer, a best of engineering at uh, some university in the Midwest. And it is useful to approach this kind of historical problem with a um, historically untrammeled mind. The mind of an engineer is, is, has, has a habit of simplifying things, and you want to simplify the approach to this. And I'm sure that Buffs, whatever his uh, his drawbacks attack the controversy with a simple mind of an engineer. But I, I think probably he presented his book without the kind of apparatus that he would like to see in a, in a work of historical importance. Two more questions, then. Right in back, one more thing.
Somewhere between the two extremes lies the truth. 